Greetings, eco nerdlings. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing factors affecting human population growth. The human population has grown very rapidly because of the expansion of agriculture. So in our past lecture, we talked about irrigation coming into play. So now we can water our crops and we don't have to migrate around as well as the industrial revolution, which brought about many different types of inventions, including steam engines, as well as modern medical care. In 2006, the population of developed countries, which means countries that are a little bit more stable, like the United States, grew exponentially at only 0.1% per year. However, developing countries grew 15 times that rate, at a rate of 1.5% per year. So where exactly are we headed? We don't know exactly how long we can continue increasing the Earth's carrying capacity for humans. We know at some point we have to reach that little, ooh, that little hump or the carrying capacity. There are likely to be between 7.2 to 10.6 billion people on Earth by 2050. And now that projection has even increased to 12 billion from 10.6. 97% of the growth is occurring in the developing countries, and those 97% are living in acute poverty. And there's a huge difference between living in acute poverty in a developing country versus a developed country like the United States. There is such a difference between being poverty-stricken in the United States versus poverty-stricken in a third world country. So what is the optimum sustainable population of the Earth based on? And what is the cultural carrying capacity? So looking at this graph, the United Nations made some projections or predictions of what's going to happen with the human population growth based on if women had a high reproductive rate, a middle of the road reproductive rate, or a low reproductive rate. So the high is basically predicting that each woman is going to give birth to 2.5 children. The medium is that the woman will give birth to two children, and the low is going to be if the woman gives birth to only 1.5 children. And obviously, we can't have 0.5 of a child, so that basically just means it's the average of the whole world overall, not that we can give birth to 0.5 of a child. So looking at this, if we go with the low number, the world population will be about 7.2 million, or billion, excuse me. If we go with the medium, it's going to be 8.9 billion. And if we go with the high, it'll be 10.6 billion. Remember, I also said they're even predicting that it might be higher than that and that the world population might actually reach 12 billion. So the population increases because the number of births and immigration decreases through deaths and emigration. So basically, the births and immigration, immigration with an I, means that people are coming into a population or into a country. So M is in. And then the emigration means that they are leaving. So people might emigrate out of a third world country and immigrate into a country such as the United States so they can find a job uh, most of the time because it's a much, much safer place than where they're coming from. So population change is equal to the number of births plus immigration, meaning coming into, minus the number of deaths, plus emigration, meaning leaving that population. So instead of using raw numbers, crude birth rates and crude death rates are used based on a total of the number of births or deaths per thousand people in a population. So looking at this chart, we're going to be looking at the average crude birth rate and the average crude death rate. And remember, this is out of 1,000 people. So 21 out of 1,000 people worldwide are going to give birth. Uh, and then nine people out of the 1,000 people worldwide will die. So again, average crude birth rates and death rates. And we have the developed countries, so we're going to have lower birth rates. And the developing countries, we're going to have much higher birth rates. And then the developing countries without China, again, you'll have an even higher because China was a developing country, but it actually implemented a birth control plan, which helped to decrease their population growth. 
Now I could read off all of these other numbers, but I'm not going to sit here and just kind of ramble through numbers that you can read yourself. So you can go ahead and pause this video. I want you to read the different numbers and look at the differences between birth rates and death rates. So you kind of get an idea of what type of countries these are. Are they developing or are they developed? And then this is the world's 10 most populous countries in the year of 2006 with projections of what those populations in the countries are going to grow into in the year of 2025. So looking at China, currently there's about 1.3 billion people. They're predicting by the year 2025 there's going to be about 1.5 billion people in China. In India, there's 1.1 billion currently, and in the year 2025 there's going to be 1.4 billion. In the United States, we see a drastic dip. So obviously China and India have the highest world populations of people. And then again, we're going to dip. The United States has a population of 300 million currently. And we're expecting that by the year 2025, we're going to have around 349, 350 million people. So again, you can go ahead and read the rest of these by yourself. So you can get an idea of the different populations in the different countries around the world. Next, we're going to be discussing human demography. So demographics is the study of human populations, and it includes a lot of statistics. We're going to compare birth rates and death rates, uh, genders, race, economic status. All of those get clumped together in the study that we call demographics. Developing countries, you've heard me use the word developing versus developed. So the definition of a developing country it basically has populations that tend to be much poorer. They're very young, so they're not growing to an old age. They typically die off younger, and they're growing much more rapidly. Whereas in developed countries, they're much more wealthy compared to the developing countries. They're much older. The country itself is older. The population is older, and people live to an older age as well. And they tend to have decreasing population sizes instead of increasing population sizes. So this is a chart right here that's showing you the developing versus the developed countries. So looking at the developing countries, obviously they have a much higher growth rate and they also have a much higher population than the developed countries. If you look right here, we're basically growing extremely, extremely slowly while these developing nations are experiencing some type of exponential growth. Now eventually they're going to have to level off, but we don't exactly know what the carrying capacity is. And that's going to be, uh, be determined by limiting factors such as food, water, shelter, the prevention of diseases in some of these countries. So even though we have modern medicine in many, many places around the world, there are still some places that don't have access to clean water, to food, to modern medicine. And that's where this gets a little bit you know, tricky trying to figure out what exactly is the carrying capacity, how many people can the earth really support. So again, developing countries contain about 80% of the world's population, and it's going to account for 90% of the projected growth of the human population on earth. So comparing developed versus developing countries requires the use of these types of demographic variables. So we look at things such as life expectancy, or how long an average newborn will live in society. Now obviously in developed countries, such as the United States, we're going to have a much higher life expectancy, typically in the upper 70s. Um, and then the life expectancy in someone in a developing country is going to be much lower. Sometimes those people don't even live into their 40s. They're dying at a much younger age because they don't have access to clean water, to food, to medical care. So another term you need to be familiar with is the total fertility rate. This is the average number of children that a woman will have in her lifetime. So is her fertility rate high if she just has one child? No, that's going to be below the world average. If she has, say, 10 kids, that's going to be much higher than the world average. So that would be an extremely high fertility rate. And then a fertility rate above, uh, we have a replacement level. So looking at this, the replacement level is basically saying that if a woman has two children, it took a man and a woman to have a child, 
those two children, once the parents die, will replace them. So there's not going to be any difference in that population because mom and dad died, they had two kids, those two kids basically take their roles in society. However, if that woman had, say, three kids, when the man and the woman die, we're going to have a total net gain of one to the population, so that's going to increase. Vice versa, if that woman only had one child, the man and the woman die, then there's going to be a net loss of one individual for the whole human population. So the gross domestic product per capita, this is a measurement of a standard of living. So the higher the gross domestic product per capita typically means the higher the standard of living. So this is the total value of all goods and services produced in a country per person. That doesn't mean your income. So it's not that everyone's making $60,000 in this country. It's saying that the total value of all goods, maybe those are textile goods, agricultural crops, can mean any different thing, oil. That is the total value of all of these goods and services produced in the country that you live in divided per person. So how much money is being you know, created in the economy per person based on our industries? Like I said, again, that can mean all of the crops that we're growing, any types of textiles that we're producing, oil, all of those contribute to the gross domestic product per capita. So here's a comparison for you guys looking at a developing country, which is Afghanistan, versus a developed country, the United States. So again, the gross domestic growth per capita is going to be 49000 so almost $50,000 in the United States per person, which is what we're producing. And again, that's not the average family income. That's how much the United States is producing per person based on the you know production of crops, textiles, oil, all of that. In Afghanistan, it's only $620 per person. The total fertility rate in the United States is 1.89. So that means the average woman is having anywhere from one to two children. Some are having zero, some are having 20, um, <laughs> if you watch some of the Lifetime shows. So that's just the average. So again, you can't have 0.89 of a child. That's just the total average of all of the females' reproductive rates or fertility rates in the United States, and that equals 1.89. Like I said, again, some people have more than one child, some people have zero children, so it just kind of depends. And in the United States, the average life expectancy is 78.6 years. While in Afghanistan, the average life expectancy is 48.7 years. So you see that drastic dip. So looking at this scatter plot graph, you can kind of see a correlation between the annual per capita gross versus the life expectancy in years of a person from that country. So the life expectancy as well as the infant mortality rate are highly correlated with the gross domestic uh, rate per capita up to about $4,000 per year. Once we hit that $4,000 per year mark, it kind of levels off and people are typically living into their 70s. And again, that's not the average family income, that's how much that country is producing per capita. So how many, you know, agricultural crops, oil, textiles, all of that, how much money are they making, and then dividing it by the number of people that they have in that country. So again, once we reach that 4,000 mark per capita, again, the life expectancy kind of teeters in the 70s. Uh, however, whenever we have a very low GDP, so for example, Sierra uh, de Leon right here, they have a, you know, gross per capita probably, you know, maybe a thousand, maybe 500 per person, and their average life expectancy is about 35. So there's a huge correlation between that. So there are two different types of migration that I want to talk about, and I want to just make sure, again, that you know the difference. And I know we talked about it a little bit in the beginning of this podcast, but I wanted to make sure I really hit home and made sure you guys understood the difference between emigration with an E and immigration with an I. So migration in general is the movement of individuals between areas, and it can have a major impact on population change. Now, migration doesn't just mean humans, it can mean different types of animals as well. We all know that some birds migrate, you know, south for the 
uh, winters and they migrate north for the summer. So any type of you know animal can migrate, not just humans. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that. So emigration with an E is when people move out of an area and it's more likely to occur in a developing country. So a lot of people are going to want to emigrate out of a country. Maybe they don't have enough food or water. Maybe that country is at war within itself and it's dangerous for those people to live there with their children. So then they want to immigrate into a developed country such as the United States where they might be able to find a job, where they're going to have clean water, where they're going to have food, and where their children and their families will probably be much more safe than they would in the developing country that they emigrated out of. So again, immigration is when people move into an area. And again, it's more likely to occur in developed countries. So immigration with an I, you're going to into a country. Emigration, you're exiting. Emigrate, exit, immigrate, into. So in some developed countries, immigration offsets or delays the normal population decline. And this happens in the United States. So in the United States, the total fertility rate in 2011 was 1.89, which is below the replacement level. So that means our population should actually be decreasing. However, because we have such a high immigration rate, it meant over that. So the total overall immigration into the United States was over 11 million. Um, and the population growth rate was actually 0.7% because of that. Instead of decreasing, it actually increased. Japan has a similar problem. They don't have quite as many people immigrating into Japan, but they still have some type of immigration. So Japan's fertility rate is 1.39, and that was in 2011. So again, their population should have been decreasing. Uh, the overall immigration, however, was over 200,000 people. So their population growth rate was about, you know, 0.2%, uh, or excuse me, minus 0.2%. So Japan population actually decreased because they only had 200,000 people emigrate into Japan versus in America when we actually had 11 million people immigrate into us. So Japan's population actually started decreasing while the American population started increasing. Well, that's all for this podcast. So if you would like to review this video or you'd like to view some other videos for AP Environmental Science, you can visit my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off. Stay nerdy until next time.